so I, uh, I called this talk this, um, Dreams, Realities and Deleuze. But what I really mean is I'd like to invite you to join me on an emotional roller coaster of an equality and diversity journey. Um, so this is slightly like a bit of a counselling session for me, so that's what you're all here for. Um, well, I'm partially joking, but not completely, because um, in this paper, what I want to talk about is three different things. I want to talk about, uh, well, I want to talk about two different things. Uh, the the C for Equality and Diversity group, and also the work that Karina Croucher and I have been doing about um, assemblages and archaeology and pedagogy. Um, and the crucial thing is that both of these are, are pretty personal topics. Um, so uh, this paper sort of explicitly acknowledges the feminist adage that the personal is political, the political is personal. Uh, and I can't really separate me from all of this. So, so I'm going to talk a bit about me as well, so I'm ever so sorry. Um, the thing that I need to be clear about here is that this isn't a paper on behalf of the C for Equality and Diversity Group or C for or whatever. I'm going to be talking about them, but it's not on, on their behalf. Uh, it's personal opinion. And it's a story about the, the personal and professional combined. And so what I want to start by talking about is the C for Equality and Diversity Group. It's not been around for long. It started in October 2015. Uh, and so you may not be familiar with it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. But ultimately, it's a personal story from the start because I'm the group's founder. Uh, so it's sort of connected to me in that regard. So um, my starting point with the Equality and Diversity Group was uh, all the statistics that we've seen before, the statistical studies have all come out and I found them all wildly frustrating. I'm talking about sort of about 2014, I've, I've come back from maternity leave and I was feeling personally quite ground down about things. I was partly in an archaeology technician job, so I was being Joan Giro's woman at home in terms of my professional life. I was feeling very ground down by the statistics. And as well as profiling the profession, I'd also done a study called Digging Diversity, where I looked at uh, both students and professionals and diversity statistics within uh, both of those bodies. And the crucial thing is that the, the student body was a lot more diverse than, the, than the, the professional body. And so that points to all the different barriers that exist uh, to, to get into the profession. I, I was also frustrated because I felt like there was lots of critique about these kind of uh, issues and really good critique and pockets of really important action. Obviously, like BWA had been around for a, for a while by, by the point that I'm sort of feeling frustrated. What I was frustrated about was that there was limited professional action. Uh, and, and as we've sort of already heard, that is really frustrating. And all of this is tied in with, for me, uh, a deep, oh, help, <laughs> deep help, there's a, there's a Freudian typo, uh, a deep, a deep held belief in the collective power of our professional body. Uh, and um, that's, I think, probably quite a, an, um, an untrendy perspective at the moment to believe deeply in CIFA, but I did and I do, um, because it's a membership body, and it's a, therefore it's a body that can affect change if it wants to and if it has people behind it. And so therefore I uh, approached uh, CIFA and, and, and colleagues in the profession about starting an equality and diversity group. And it's out of that 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 started with a bunch of really amazingly committed people, several of whom are here in the room today, um, uh, uh, with a really sort of vibrant uh, committee uh, um, uh, uh, driving the, the group. The group was set up, and there was reference to that slightly at the end of Becky's paper, the group was set up as a special interest group, and I'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. And um, that's within sort of CIFA's structures. So um, so that's that's my starting point. There's the CIFA Equality and Diversity Group. It started in October 2015. I'll come back to that in a second. I just want to think very briefly about the stuff that we've got, the, 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 the powerful arsenal of tools and people and bodies and legislation that we've got on our side to address equality and diversity issues. So we've mentioned very briefly the Equality Act 2010. It already came up earlier. This is the legal framework that we've got to tackle disadvantage and discrimination within the profession and particularly addresses, well, not within the profession, within, within the world. It's a legal framework uh, that, that deals with the protected characteristics of age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion and belief, sex and sexual orientation. So that legislative framework exists. Um, and then there's so much sector specific work about equality and diversity that is out there. Um, 
We're all familiar with the really robust academic critique uh, about equality and diversity issues, but it's starting with feminism in the 1980s and, uh, and then becoming much more intersec uh, intersectional uh, uh, over the years. Um, there's uh, now uh, some excellent guidance documents, not on sexual harassment, that's the wrong wording, isn't it? Uh, but uh, uh, against sexual harassment and codes of conduct to deal with that. So there's the Society for American Archaeologists um, uh, guidance document that's the, the original one. There's then the Badger Respect one, which is uh, new and exciting. And if you've not seen it, then have a look. There's people, individuals and organisations who worked on their own codes of conduct, like Dig Ventures. Sarah Perry's fantastic one that's free to access on, on Google. Those kind of things exist. We've got the fantastic organisations. We've already heard from British women archaeologists today and trailblazers, but other organisations as well that deal with this intersectionality that this session is, 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 uh, is here to address, like the Enabled Archaeology Foundation and the Badger Respect Group. And those guys are all very active on social media. There's also various other social media uh, things out there. There's all the studies and statistics. We've heard fantastic, um, well, fast, horrible British women archaeologist statistics uh, this morning um, uh, already. There's digging diversity, there's profiling the profession. And then there's uh, things like uh, a lot of the CIFA special interest groups like the Diggers Forum and NewGen have done their own studies as well. So we've got lots of statistics about diversity. Anne's right, you said before, we've got so many statistics. We don't really need any more, we've got a lot. Um, and then there's the work of equality and diversity officers and policies and government agencies, initiatives by commercial organisations. So, for example, Cotswold Archaeology undertook the MIND Mental Health Workplace Survey uh, recently. HE have done some brilliant work about uh, uh, bullying and harassment under uh, Brian Kerr. And then there's third sector organisations reaching out to, to, to non-archaeologists to, to, to try and diversify engagement with the profession. So there's all of that that exists. And within all of that kind of context, there's the C for Equality and Diversity group. So as I said, we've only really been going for three years, and a lot of our work has been focused inwards on CIFA's practice, on CIFA's own practice. So we've done a lot to um, uh, uh, change things like the code of conduct and the group constitutions. We put in a thing about being able to take maternity leave, and then I tested it out by taking maternity leave, and it worked, it was good. Um, uh, we've contributed to things like CIFA's uh, practice papers on things like ethics. Uh, we're consulting uh, quite closely with uh, CIFA about the individual chartership process that's going through at the moment. And then we've connected with other bodies like Prospect and RICS, looking at the kind of stuff that they do, getting training from them about things like the Equality Act. We've run mental health first aid workshops. We're going to be running an unconscious bias session in, um, uh, in the new year. We've run a series of conference, CIFA conference sessions that have provided CPD workshops that have been about uh, taking action in the workplace for employers, about taking action in the workplace for equality and diversity. We've had representation at Pride. We've developed all sorts of, or working on developing all sorts of uh, guidance documents, particularly around uh, disability. Uh, and we've got a website which we're trying to use to represent different voices and to be a hub of information to point people elsewhere. Uh, and that's sort of just in, at the moment under a little bit of, uh, um, uh, we're, we're tinkering with it a bit at the moment. And in the 2017, we supported the Trailblazers uh, Raising Horizons exhibition to be at uh, the CIFA um, conference. Um, and I think the last point raises the, the point this, uh, 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 with that, that um, I'd like to think that what we do is complement the organisations that you've already heard and seen in the session today uh, and come at that kind of stuff from a slightly different angle. We're applying the same pressures and we're uh, raising the same issues, but from a, a slightly different angle. So, hooray, we've got all of this stuff. Brilliant. Well, remember, we're on the emotional roller coaster of equality and diversity. But ooh, we still have all of these things. These things still exist. We still have a long term embedded cross sector problem with bullying and harassment. We still have cr uh, cross sector discrimination on all of those protected characteristics in the Equality Act that are protected by law. We still flout the law. We still have massive amounts of inequality. So we still have harassment and discrimination that creates and perpetuates personal and culturally embedded discrimination. And that's explicit, awful, awful stories of harassment in awful ways, but also implicit, just the general grinding down of the patriarchy, basically. 
I can say it, <laughs> say it in this session, hooray. Um, and all of those things lead to a profound lack of diversity in our profession and barriers both to entry into the profession and progression through them. We mentioned the leaky pipeline and the glass ceiling, let's add that in, those things are there. The, the thing that I think has been very interesting is in the last year, the hashtag me too and the hashtag times up movements have been extremely powerful in, in calling and calling for action on these in the profession. And, you know, I'm in the room with a lot of people who've used that social media platform to really vocalise that. In terms of the equality and diversity group, one of the things that we, we hear, hearing that we felt we need, we need to do something. And so, on the 6th of July this year, we held a, a cross-sector meeting with the aim of achieving a coherent collective action on equality, diversity and inclusion. There was five things we wanted to do on that day, uh, which was agree a vision for equality and diversity in the heritage sector, and then uh, work through a series of actions and solutions, agree how we're going to do that, what the time frame was for those, uh, who should have responsibility for them, and develop a cross-sector statement to articulate all of those things. It was, I think I found it really exciting as a meeting because there was a really wide range of participants there from across the sector. So from the commercial sector, we had the CEOs of Wessex and Oxford and the head of heritage for HS2. We also had MOLA and Northlight and Preconstruct all represented there. There was Prospect, there was people from local government, from national government, from academia, from the third sector, from independent bodies, there was people from professional bodies and societies, and see for themselves also had a member of the board, uh, employees and representatives from all the different special interests, well, all of them, but many of the different special interest groups as well. So it was a, it was a, a really exciting and, and, uh, and genuinely cross-sector membership. So there were some really great things from the day. I put it in capitals, because they were great. Um, the, the most, I think exciting thing was that there was a fundamental agreement and consensus about the need for immediate action on, uh, on uh, um, uh, the sector's poor record on equality and diversity. Uh, one of the things that really helped, I think, in the discussion uh, was Sarah May's fantastic analogy that she drew between the, um, the health and safety uh, culture change that's occurred in the in the profession over the last 20 years and the need for that with regards equality and diversity so she pointed out that the kind of stuff that happened 20 years ago just in terms of health and safety just wouldn't be allowed now uh, it would it, it it's it's really a fundamental culture shift that's happened with regard to health and safety and that analogy was really helpful in the room on the day I think to really sort of draw out the kind of change that needs to happen and all the participants from the day came together and uh, agreed a statement. Ooh, that's your most rubbish slide from TAG because it's loads of text. But let me... <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry about reading it. I'll just give you the, the, the key things. This is a statement that each organisation was going to put out. So it begins, we insert organisation. And basically what this says is that the organisation that signed up to it would recognise the need for action and also the heritage sector's legal responsibility its responsibility to comply to the to the equality act uh, to to bring about changes in equality and diversity across the profession um, and particularly what this uh, uh, statement says is a kind of first thing would be to implement a code of conduct uh, and um, oh please don't tweet this feel free to take photos but please don't tweet it um, um, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and um, to, um, to, to make clear about employees reporting harassment, to make clear um, uh, what people should do within the specific organisation that was signing the statement, uh, um, to, to call out harassment and discrimination, and that they would implement a code of conduct as well. So it's very much a starting point, but a really important starting point. Hooray! Except me saying, please don't tweet this, might have given away. But we're going to now dive on the emotional roller coaster of equality and diversity. Um, because this statement obviously didn't go out. The 6th of July meeting was fantastic. The momentum seemed to be quite massive. But um, what has happened subsequently is that CIFA's own board pointed out that, yes, let's go back up again, pointed out that the 6th of July meeting was a relatively ad hoc thing. 
And what they've argued is that instead, we need to have some kind of much more unified, large scale action. And so to achieve that, they've convened their industry working party, which comprises representatives from CIFA and FAME and Prospect, and I think that Algeo and national government are involved as well, um, to develop a cross-sector statement and strategy for equality and diversity. So this is an ongoing conversation, which should be reporting on in 2019. It's also provoked a degree of soul searching within CIFA. What is CIFA's real scope and remit of, uh, in terms of leading on equality and diversity? What should they be doing? Where is the, there's a fuzzy area, CIFA are always very concerned about not doing, not doing the union's job. So, so what's their role? Um, uh, and so the board asked the advisory council to create a working party uh, to report on this. And, and they'll be reporting to the board in, 2000, in February 2019. Um, so that's kind of what's going on there. And, and, and for those of us who, uh, uh, with a sharp intake of breath about the Equality and Diversity Group being a special interest group, that kind of thing is being considered uh, in, as part of that. Okay, so how should one feel about all of this on the roller coaster of this? And this is why this is a personal paper, I think. I think I have to be honest and say that I personally felt genuinely really frustrated. We had some really great momentum on the 6th of July uh, and after that, and, and it's, it's, it's easy to feel like that's been stymied. But I can equally be honest and say that my hope is unwavering that the current course of action will actually make more of a difference than the 6th of July did. After all, that was a starting point. Uh, and hopefully the current course of action will explicitly engage with a much bigger body of people and speak to a much broader range of professionals. And part of the hopefulness that I feel for the future about this comes from the stuff that I've been doing, the theoretical stuff that I've been doing elsewhere. And it's tag. So let's turn to some theory so that we can feel better. Um, hey! Um, so, um, elsewhere, Karina Croucher and I are in the very final stages of writing a book about pedagogy and teaching and learning and training in archaeology. Uh, and we've been particularly looking towards Deleuze and Guattari uh, and assemblage theory. Uh, and this feels like it has nothing to do with the equality and diversity group, but stick with me because we'll come back to it in a second. Um, so um, we've been reading a lot of Deleuze and Guattari and we're particularly influenced by the idea of becoming. The idea uh, of uh, their idea of becoming challenges arborescent, hierarchical, binary, linear models of becoming. And instead, they want to, they, they, they argue that we should think about becoming as being like a rhizome, like a root, rhizomatic, as being uh, multiple and non hierarchical and having no beginning or end to it, following lots of different lines of flight. Karina and I find this really useful for thinking about archaeological pedagogy, for thinking about training and how we become archaeologists. Um, and particularly, we've combined this with uh, sort of the corollary of Deleuze and Guattari's assemblage theory, uh, um, work on assemblages that comes out of this, and particularly Delandian assemblage theory, uh, to think about the material dimensions of how we learn in archaeology as well. We're really interested in thinking about how people and things are always entwined, how they continually emerge through their relationships with one another. Um, and the joy of an assemblage approach is that it, it it looks at how assemblages exist at different scales, how they're made of multiple people and multiple things, uh, and how those assemblages affect one another, how they're more than the, uh, the, the, um, more than the combination of all their parts. What do I mean? There's a phrase, but I've forgotten the word. Um, anyway, we've been looking at this in relation to pedagogy. We've particularly been arguing that we should think about learning as happening in multiple assemblages, at multiple scales. And so we've been really interested in in what we're calling learning assemblages. And this kind of an approach demands a fundamental change to our pedagogic practice because it, it highlights that learning isn't a linear process. So it's not just about a banking model where a teacher tells the students, uh, but that it, it emphasizes that learning is multiple, thank you very much, uh, and, and it emphasizes the role of materials in, in affecting the learning process. And we're particularly interested in this 
in relation to equality and diversity particularly. We've got a whole chapter on it. Uh, we argue that we can use this approach to diversify our, our, our teaching and learning um, because it allows us to think about how the material dimensions of learning assemblages might work to uh, further marginalise the non-normative or it might work to include people with uh, with, with different identities and weave new stories uh, into, into our teaching and learning. And an awareness of this allows us to be truly intersectional um, and to really <coughs> diversify our pedagogy. So here's just a really quick example. These are all the, I don't know if they're called, are they called love locks? These where people put padlocks on chains to, to, to enact their love along the waterfront uh, in front of Albert Dock in Liverpool. Uh, this is um, a World Heritage Site. So we went and looked at these, me and my third year uh, in, uh, uh, in the course Why the Past Matters, to look at this, how this act of effectively uh, intangible heritage, or, or somewhere in between tangible and intangible heritage, um, works to tell personal stories, to tell non-normative stories about love and loss, and how those stories resist the um, androcentric, colonialising narratives of world heritage that are encapsulated in the, the Albert Dock. So there's a little, a, a little example to throw into all of this. Anyway, you're probably wondering what this all has to do with the Equality and Diversity Group. So um, whilst I've been working on this book with Karina um, and thinking about all this stuff in relation to pedagogy, this has brought me back to reflecting on my wider professional equality and diversity emotional roller coaster. And it, it's highlighted to me that the, the approach that we, that Karina and I have been thinking about in terms of learning assemblages and to the process of becoming archaeologists extends way beyond what we've been arguing about in terms of teaching and learning. It extends to the whole profession and therefore it, it extends to the, the, the question of equality and diversity <coughs> more broadly. I think it's really tempting to see that the process by which we make our profession equal and diverse as being some kind of linear process in which X happens, then Y happens, then Z happens, and so on. But actually, that's not how life works, and that's not how our profession works. Our profession is messy. It's really messy, and it's not linear, is it? And we flipping hate hierarchies, don't we? We... We need to reconfigure then how we become equal and diverse in our profession and think about, about it in rhizomatic terms and in assemblage terms as well, where multiple assemblages of people and things are constantly affecting one another in a range of different ways and at different scales. And I, your, your slide, Becky, that showed um, uh, Dorothy Garrod in the centre was basically the same as this, just with people. Uh, and, and so I think that's uh, it's, it's really true. Uh, and really interesting to think about in that way. So um, this is a relatively personal paper, and I'm going to come back to me to finish. Um, just to say that, uh, to finish by saying that, um, I, although it has its frustrations, ultimately I'm proud to be part of the assemblage of CIFA and its various mechanisms, which are working very slowly, but will affect change slowly. But equally, because of these multiple assemblages of which we're all part of and which will ultimately enact change in terms of our equality and diversity, I'm also proud to be in those other assemblages and to stand side by side with the other inspirational people that we've heard this morning um, in assemblages that emerge through social media and they emerge through conferences and being here at TAG uh, and that, that demand uh, immediate action. And I think the great thing about seeing this rhizomatically is seeing that all of these kind of things connect and they're messy and they're all effective in all sorts of different ways. And so I just want to finish the paper finally by uh, thinking about one last assemblage, the assemblage of social media. It was the Me Too and Time's Up narratives that really have spurred on action. And I think we need to keep up that kind of, profession, uh, kind of pressure. We need to keep calling out sexism and discrimination. 
Um, so I'm sort of finishing this with, a, with, a, with an ask, really. Um, I set up the Everyday Sexism um, uh, Twitter account in 2015 with Kath Poucher, who's uh, now unfortunately left the profession in the leaky pipeline-ness of everything. Um, and, uh, and I've not really done anything on it for a while. I'd really love it if anyone was interested, if they would, might want to join me. And let's, let's use this. Uh, I know that there's fantastic so closed social media groups where people can really share their experiences. But let's use something like Twitter to call out this kind of thing, to keep calling out and to keep extending rhizomatically into people's assemblages to affect change in terms of equality and diversity. Thanks very much.